So it's now time for our next panel, Distressed M&A with Merger Markets' Catherine Ford, who is moderating this panel. Catherine, over to you. Uh, thank you, Juliana. And uh, welcome to this session looking at distressed M&A activity. And I think there is an expectation that with the challenges that businesses have gone through over the last six months, um, there might indeed be an increase in distressed M&A activity. Um, here to help me discuss this topic, I have a wonderful panel and I'm going to ask them all to introduce themselves. We will then have a conversation amongst ourselves. But as always, I would really encourage you guys watching us uh, to post questions. There's a question box at the bottom of your screen and if you put a question in there it will appear magically on my computer here and we will try and answer as many of those questions as we possibly can. Um, let's start with a few words of introduction just to set the scene and understand how our panelists are fitting into this conversation. Jonathan you're first on my screen so maybe you could tell the audience a little about yourself please. Sure John Neiswander with Schottentor Capital. I'm sitting in Vienna Austria at the moment. I've Great. been involved with this distress for over 25 years um, as a turnaround manager, as an advisor to boards and management, as a distressed investor. And Shantor mostly focused on distressed opportunities in Central and Eastern Europe. So okay. a little bit uh, in Western Europe, given the current circumstances. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Next to you, I've got Matthew. Matthew, can you tell the audience about yourselves and how you fit into the conversation? Well, thanks, Catherine. Uh, Matthew Quaid, I'm with BMT. Uh, we are cross border special situations experts and um, particular focus on turnaround restructuring uh, and MA situations. And uh, we do particularly focus on the operational side of transactions as well as the financial. So uh, we don't just advise, we actually, our guys actually go into situations and work in the, in the client companies hands on. So Okay, thank you very much. Next on my screen, I have Wojciech. Wojciech, could you tell the audience a little about yourself and the fund that you're here representing? Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Thanks for the invitation. So, look, uh, Oak Bridge Capital is, uh, has been involved in uh, Central and Eastern Europe for a long time. We've been initially uh, advising our M&A activities in Poland for about 15 years. Then out of uh, London, we've been advising Oak Tree Capital in investing at the time of the first crisis, 2008 and onwards on investing in distress in Poland. And uh, for the last several years, we've been advising um, special opportunities funds um, on looking in Poland. And, uh, and indeed, you know, it's a very interesting time right now. So happy to discuss that. I love how you describe it as an interesting time rather than a soul destroying, depressing time. Great. I, I like the optimism that's going to carry us through this. Thank you very much. Finally, Les, can you tell us a little about yourself and how you fit into the conversation? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lech Liczynski. Uh, I'm a lawyer admitted to practice in Poland. I, I, I have been in uh, the insolvency, restructuring and distressed investing space for the last 20 years, advising uh, various categories of stakeholders, including credit, creditors, debtors, administrators and distressed investors. I am currently a partner at, at uh, Wolf Ties, uh, based in Warsaw, running the restructuring and insolvency practice. But I am also focused, for, uh, but I also focus on the entire uh, region, and I am the CE coordinator for restructuring, insolvency, and distressed investments at Wolf Ties. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And maybe Lech, I could come to you first of all. Um, I'd like to hear from all of you, of course, um, how things have been. What have been some of the key challenges that you've had to deal with? What have been some of the unexpected things that have, have come across your desk over the last six months? Lech, maybe you can set us off giving an overview of where you think the market in general is in this particularly challenging time. Well, I, I, indeed, the market is, is, is very, uh, very challenging. Uh, I, I believe we, we may have seen a, an even bigger number of restructuring uh, activities in the marketplace, uh, but for the anti-crisis uh, shields uh, introduced uh, in uh, various countries by, by the governments, uh, including, uh, including in Poland. Um, uh, I, th I think, though, we are we are facing. Um, uh, uh, I don't want to threaten it, and anyone, <laughs> but <laughs> but I am afraid we are we are we are facing a, a, some kind of a depression for for uh, some period of time. 
to give you an example, I, I spoke yesterday with, uh, with one of the key doctors in one of the key uh, pandemic hospitals in, 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 in Warsaw, and, and in his view, we, we, we might be really heading for the last quarter uh, of uh, 2022 for the things to, to calm down. Uh, so, um, I mean, regarding the level of, uh, of uh, restructuring ac activities, coming back to that, uh, some things have already uh, started, uh, and I, I think certain credit should be given to, to the introduction of a new chapter on the so-called simplified restructuring proceedings in Poland, because uh, various debtors uh, started, uh, started a restructuring pursuant to that chapter, which is very much uh, debtor-friendly. It remains to be seen how uh, how fast the distressed uh, M and A's will start in the marketplace. But maybe uh, just at this introductory stage, I, I I will I will mention that those simplified restructuring proceedings can can also be a, 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 a you know a forum for running distressed M and A's. But maybe I will explain a, a little later, giving now uh, more space to 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 the other panelists. Great, thank you very much. Um, really interesting to get sort of the insight of what's happening at your end. Jonathan, can you talk to us about you guys? What have you had to do? How have you had to adjust your interaction with the market? How have you dealt with companies within your portfolio in these unprecedented times? Well, the, obviously the, the primary difference is now we're doing everything on Zoom. <laughs> Tell I'm, me about it. To be a road warrior on the road four or five days a week and <laughs> the last six months I've just been doing these even like massive consulting jobs where we talk to management and everyone is on the computer all the time there's certainly a massive change and it's likely to have you know long-term interesting effects on how we all view digital technology yeah position ourselves um i think one of the interesting things we've seen is um the unpredictability of this whole sort of event as some people for a loop, right? We started off in in March, the phone was ringing off the hook, everything was shut down, everyone was in crisis mode, everyone expected massive liquidity crunches and you know, bankruptcies and things falling off a cliff and nothing like that happened at all. So we worked with companies that actually either through their sponsors or through the banking system or government were able to actually manage the liquidity crisis fairly well and come out of that sort of into a sort of, um, let's say a stagnant period by summer. I guess some people were talking about a V-shaped recovery, but they think here, I made a little graphic, here's some high-tech graphics here. And so in the V-shaped recovery, we're talking about the square root recovery. <laughs> we come up, but then we don't go anywhere. It just kind of drags along. That seems to be where we're headed, which is, um, and I think not what anyone anticipated back in March and is sort of throwing even, I think even the distressed investors are a little bit confused with what they should be doing because it's not the massive blood in the streets everyone was hoping for where you'd buy everything cheap. You still have to find value and you still have to identify which companies are going to survive. But if um, I can just pitch, uh, respond directly to that, um, it's not been the bloodbath that we expected, but how much of, of that is because the government has intervened in the market in a unprecedented way? Is it something where really the problems have just been sort of shoved along the road for a little bit and it will there will be a bloodbath or, or where do you think things are going to be going? I think they've shut it down the road. I think it may be a lot like 2008, where we're just going to have sort of a trickle effect. Things will get yeah. slowly worse and worse and worse and worse until we end up with a, you know, but it's never going to be a massive collapse, it doesn't look like. So we've, we've avoided that scenario, I think, at this point. Okay, thank you very much. Matthew, can I come to you? You and I spoke yesterday um, about some of the, um, how, how you guys are very much involved in the operations of the business. And when I've spoken to people, um, on the private equity side about the involvement that they've had with their portfolio companies. It sounds very much as if people have become even more active, even more engaged with their portfolio companies, making adjustments that in some cases they had no intention of making yeah. or making them much quicker than they had planned initially. Talk to us from the from the distressed M&A side. You're obviously dealing with businesses that are already in challenging circumstances. How much more challenging have they become? How much more engaged have you had to be with these businesses now? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think just to, to give one example, I mean, I, actually, as as lockdown hit, I was in the middle of a, an integration, a cross border integration of a um, a business that had, had bought a, a foreign subsidiary, and um, 
the immediate shift in in what we were working on which actually was all focused you know typically our work whether we're going into a truly distressed situation or, or some other form of change is obviously around trying to find efficiencies yeah. and process improvements um, and suddenly with the the, the change of, of rules that were also differently being being obviously implemented differently in different countries and you really had to get your head around uh, what impact that had and what you were allowed to do in different situations whether you're in a manufacturing company or a services business or whatever it was and actually a lot of the changes you then had to make from an operational perspective flew in the face of what you would normally do in terms of trying to improve efficiency and things like that and and, and did have a cost to them um, but I think also what we learned very quickly was the most important thing um, so it's, it's interesting you know Jonathan says one of the big changes obviously is doing a lot on zoom which is true but actually, you know, we recognise very quickly you cannot lead significant change remotely. Yeah. Uh, and having people on the ground in the different jurisdictions is absolutely key who, who actually can guide people physically through the changes that needed to be made, um, both in response to COVID initially and the kind of health and safety requirements that were in place. But then obviously immediately moving on from that to going, well, exactly how is the, does, can this is this business model functional and viable anymore in in this environment and how long is it going to last for and everything else so i think um yeah actually you you ended up needing to get people out on, on site as quickly as you you could in a lot of situations to manage that change and, and um, how have you done that because in some cases you couldn't travel or you could or people said but people said well do you know what it might be fun and games for you to say i need you in that location but i personally don't want to go yeah. So, so per personal, personal preferences obviously massively come into it and some people yeah. just did not want to travel. But actually, in a lot of countries, I think there was a big misunderstanding initially in terms of what actually the rules were that were put in place and also whether they were actually rules or guidelines. Um, and the important thing was to recognise immediately to actually look at things in black and white when things were released in writing and see well, what does it actually tell you you can and can't do. Um, the problem is in different countries, the levels of fear that governments tried to instill in people was also different. Um, so in, and in some countries that was very successful and the level of fear that was 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 put into populations was, was such that nobody wanted to go anywhere or do anything. Um, but in other countries, it was a bit more pragmatic. So, um, yeah, you just have to adjust to the, to the different situations. But the, the key thing was really knowing the rules. And mm. I had several examples of companies where I was phoned by CEOs uh, when their governments were announcing uh, changes to, to rules and, and they were sort of like, well, you know, this is no good. We can't carry on with the project. We're just going to have to shut down, aren't we? Uh, and I, I said to them, you know, of course, 10, 11 o'clock at night. Why? Uh, you need to go and actually look at the rules in black and white and listen again to the speeches that have been made because there were words like essential being bandied around and things like this. But actually, when you listen to what they were in relation to, um, yeah, there were different approaches. Some countries took an approach that was you, everybody shuts down unless we say you are an essential business. Mm. Other countries, it was much more around uh, you can stay open unless we tell you you have to shut down. But if you don't have to travel to work, don't. So there was all of these mixed things going on in different places. And, and the key thing was understanding that and then working out how you could implement that in relation to the different businesses. So. Um, but I think in a, we've seen we saw in a lot of different countries the both business leaders and populations reaction to the various different lockdown rules showing a real misunderstanding in terms of what was actually what was actually in black and white and being asked for. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Wojciech, let me bring you into this conversation. Talk to us about the impact that you have felt and what adjustments you've made and how that will play out in the future relationship between you and your portfolio companies and other stakeholders that you're involved with. Super. Um, thank you, Catherine. Uh, look, uh, I think we have gone through a bit of a merry-go-round in a sense uh, over the last six months. In a sense, you know, we have been working on several deals which were special opportunities deals. We, we saw that uh, we've worked hard on them, trying to understand the companies, trying to work out where is the special opportunity for our invest uh, our investment how we can make the value add um, materialize there and then suddenly covid comes in the whole uh, expectation of the of the crisis comes in and suddenly yes you know we have to start looking at the portfolio companies first of all with the funds we are working with 
Then uh, after stabilizing the position with the portfolio companies, you start looking at very immediate gains. The immediate gains are let's invest in, uh, in the stock market or quoted opportunities, which are discounted, which we can do immediately. We can see immediate gains. By the way, others are doing the safe, mm. same thing, so it's quite safe. Let's, let's go this direction. Uh, then why not go into, and I'm looking from the London uh, funds perspective, then why not go where we, where we know the markets are much better than Central and Eastern Europe? So why not look at immediate opportunities of distress in, in Western Europe? Yeah. Then we start looking at it and start saying, well, actually, yeah, but Western Europe doesn't look so good as far as the prospects. There is quite a, quite a big challenge. Um, so maybe let's start looking at those opportunities in Central and Eastern Europe. And here we come back expecting this major uh, opportunities to be available. And frankly, given the government help, given uh, how banks reacted and given the inherent stability and growth in the, in the countries, you actually didn't see so much of this. So step into uh, you know, the six months and we are back in the situation where we are going back to our original deals. Actually, re let's revisit them. Let's look at them again. Actually, nothing much has happened for time being in those countries. And let's look at those opportunities again. So it's about six months lost in a sense of, of, of trying to deal with the situation that we have faced. Um, and when we are revisiting the positions which, 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 which were there, that's on one point. Uh, and the other is, of course, technology. And whilst, of course, we can close the deals without visiting the companies, without looking at uh, in the eyes of, of, of our partners, frankly, uh, Zoom, Teams and everything else allows us to talk quicker, not to fly over, to, to have five conversations a day rather than one uh, for three days. And that's a huge help for, for, for us. So I think the shift in mentality and just people accepting that actually meeting the chief executive of the company over Zoom is just as polite as normally visiting him and spending two days traveling. It's, 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 it's a, this is the positive of that. This is, this is the positive of that. I, I like the positive. You have a very positive attitude there, Wojciech. I, I absolutely like that. That's brilliant. Now, um, <laughs> now um, let's come to a topic that Jonathan touched on uh, a little bit earlier in the conversation, liquidity. It's one of those words that, uh, as I've had conversations over the course of this event and the Nordic event that we hosted yesterday, has, has become sort of the, the word that companies are thinking about the entire time. Where's my liquidity? Um, how long can I sustain the levels of liquidity necessary to run the business effectively? And obviously, while we do see businesses being propped up by government incentives, we also do see some businesses struggling when it comes to liquidity. But obviously, that's quite a different scenario to real distressed M&A that you guys are investing in. Do you think there is any concern from players within the market to get slightly confused about those two particular topics and more investors piling into situations that are actually not distressed and just re liquidity related? So I'd like to have a bit of a conversation around like where are investors in the market coming from at the moment? Who are you seeing as your competitors in the area? Where is, where is the deal flow coming from? Matthew, maybe I can come to you on that one first of all. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I think there's, there's for a long time now, uh, th there's been um, uh, some misuse of the word distress, I guess. Um, and, and, you know, we, we've worked with a, a number of different parties over the years. And you, you quickly find out then they'll, they'll tell you they're interested in distressed investment. Uh, and you very quickly find out then really not <laughs> um, what, what you might vaguely class as a special situation, possibly, but, um, but true distress. No. And I, I think, I think the problem with this crisis, is actually, the, the, regardless of the government help um the truly distressed businesses that that are going to cut that, that are coming through now and will you know are either in industries that um uh, have undergone a fundamental shake-up as a result of uh, of this and and possibly may never recover or if they do it will be a long long way off um or are, are you know they their their own individual business model is fundamentally unviable anyway and actually, you need those businesses to go through significant change or mm. even just fade away uh, or crash away even. So um, and one of the problems with the government help is potentially that that 
gives them an extra liquidity shot to keep them going for a period longer when really they shouldn't. And we had all this after the financial, we've had it yeah. for 10 years after the financial crisis. Um, but I think there is, um, I think there's still appetite for true distress deals if it's a bolt on deal to an existing uh, investment. I think that's, that's still possible where obviously, uh, you know, if, you, if you've got a company that actually is not doing too badly despite what's gone on and you've got the opportunity to pick up some extra capacity or some extra technology in particular that you can plug into an existing investment, then uh, there's definitely appetite there. But otherwise, I would say what we've seen is a lot of people kind of at the moment still thinking the uncertainty is just too much and hunkering down. Um, and, and true distress deals are, are we're not seeing a lot of appetite for uh, other than in a bolt on, a bolt -on situation. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan and Wojciech, maybe I can come to you because I know mm -hmm. that we spoke about that yesterday. How much true distress is there actually in the CE region compared to Western Europe? I mean, how many businesses are there that you would really classify as truly distressed rather than just, you know, slightly wobbly because there's a liquidity crisis. Uh, Wojciech, maybe I can come to you first and then Jonathan, over to you. Yeah, first of all, I agree with Matthew that, you know, where most of the people in special opportunities on distress, are, where they are look, what they are looking for is not real distressed, is this illiquid or the, the, the companies that fa fall into the liquidity gap. And there would have been a lot of those situations but in this current crisis, again, we've seen the creditors, the banks, um, quite often, but not always bondholders, yeah. and, and clearly the government uh, extending the helping hand and stepping in where <coughs> we would have expected, the, where we would have hoped that, that the special opportunities funds can come in and make their money. So, so in a sense, this simple liquidity uh, problem has been managed effectively by this, um, by this financial institutions and government support. And therefore, I think what we are seeing is a restructuring cases and opportunities, which we've seen uh, still to be the same cases half a year ago. Mm. You know, those are the same companies which were struggling half a year ago, nine months ago, that uh, are still here and are still saying, Hey, why don't you talk about uh, to us about about investing in 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 our business? Um, new, very exciting or or good businesses with temporary problems where turnaround could be uh, implemented. Not yet, not, uh, maybe later, but but not yet. And maybe last point that I wanted to make is that actually some of those restructured uh, companies in problems uh, that we have seen half a year ago or nine months ago or a year ago, where we were saying they'll probably no longer be around today, given the crisis, they had an excuse. They, they suddenly had somewhere to go for uh, money. Uh, they, they, they got the government grants. They got some help. The banks stood uh, away for, for six months. And they are still here uh, a little bit using the situation. So those guys will probably in the next six, 12 months fail but those are not the guys we should be saving really maybe okay thank you very much you make a really interesting yeah, interesting point there the businesses that uh, are doomed they were doomed before the crisis and the crisis won't necessarily save them jonathan maybe can you give us a little bit of insight on this this uh, topic of distressed in ce and where it stands compared to what we're seeing in western europe yeah i think i've you know, touched on that that there's there's less obvious distress in ce I think what's the interesting opportunity is going to be down the road in a few years when you've got companies that borrowed money and are leveraged up based on multiple expectations that aren't going to hold now because now their earnings are down and also the multiples have changed. So you've got companies that are going to have to refinance in two or three years and are not going to be able to justify the valuation and someone's going to have to take it in the shorts, whether it's the lenders or it's the equity side. For example, it's really interesting. We do a lot of healthcare. Um, and healthcare traditionally was seen as a recession-proof industry. People invest in healthcare because that's where you're going to hide your money when things go bad. <laughs> now, funnily enough, that's not the way it's turned out in COVID at all. And some, <laughs> some parts of healthcare have done well, like labs. But if you're in, in the surgery side of the business, you've done horribly. The surgery has gone to a, a you know, complete yeah. stop. There's no elective surgery anymore. The high margin businesses like um, plastic surgery, orthopedics, dental, 
have come into a, you know, it almost stops. There's no liquidity in those areas. There's no capital expenditure in the hospitals. So this has really had a lot of ripple effects, which means there's going to be a lot of a lot of interesting opportunities in that sector, for example, two or three years when those companies haven't quite managed to come back to where they were last year. The multiples aren't there. They've got to go refinance these these in some cases fairly large and leveraged situations they put themselves in. You've segued us very nicely into a conversation around sectors. Lek, maybe I can come to you first on that one. Um, talk to us about where you see the greatest opportunities emerging. We've talked about healthcare and some of the areas there. Um, can, um, can you enlighten us a little bit where you're seeing the focus? Not just you know one 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 piece of doubt, so to speak, on on those liquidity issues. One, one, one thing. Uh, because I, I agree with Wojciech that the, the, the governmental aid is uh, is filling the, the liquidity gap in various ways, but this is this is the theory in a sense because whenever it takes the form of, of a uh, financing, then and, and there are obviously ex ex existing layers of fin financing, you may well be facing issues like uh, who is going to be super senior, who is going to subordinate, and and uh, to give you an example. I was instructed uh, on a deal of this type about three weeks ago, but commercial discussions are still pending and it is uh, far from being closed. So, so you know, and if, if, if you know, people, I mean, if, if the, the, the existing financiers do not uh, come, come to terms, I mean, that could be, could result in, in the insolvency of the company. So, but that's, that's, a, that's a side remark, so, so, so to speak. Now, I mean, regarding the sectors, I, 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 I think the usual suspects would be, uh, would be hotels and uh, ga ga gastronomy uh, sector as, as, as well. Um, I think, um, you know, generally real estate uh, is um, in danger as well. So, some sectors of those, uh, those, obviously, because logistics is, is, is booming, but uh, obviously retail is, is, is more of a problem. I mean, various, uh, I think Jonathan uh, or, or, or Matthew would be the best to comment on the various other industries where, 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 where you, you know, where the opportunities are uh, and or will be available. But I, I, I think that the steel industry is, is, is another example where, where you can find various uh, opportunities. Mm. Uh, Jonathan and Wojciech, on the topic of hotels and real estate, those are two areas that you mentioned um, that you were actually surprised that they weren't, or Jonathan, you specifically on hotels, that it wasn't actually as badly affected. Can you talk to us about your thoughts on the hotel space? I'm not sure I would say, no, I think it's more, um, to clarify, it is badly affected. I think what we are, we have a mandate from a family office we're looking at that only wants to buy hotels. I think my mind because no one else is. So they think they've got a niche opportunity there to find hotels with good track records with the thesis that tourism is going to come back eventually. So now we'll make a note of that and then we'll have you back next year and you can tell us all <laughs> about that. I think this is a great case study that we're lining up here. <laughs> and they've got very big pockets and they're looking all across the EE and they've already closed, I think, a few deals in Poland. They're looking in, in the Balkans as well. Oh, that's really interesting yeah, long, to, long to hear. So there are people taking risks, and I've heard other people who you know, will not touch hotels under any circumstance and will close the door if you even mention them. So you got but, you have all kinds. But if you're talking about a family office, they obviously have a, a very long-term game plan that they're working with. You're not talking right. about a traditional private equity or distress fund that does eventually have to return something on their investment. Does that make it slightly different for them? I think it does. Right. They have they have a longer-term view, so they're looking. You know, they can afford to look ten years out. Okay. Um, otherwise, on the sector front, anything that you'd like to add there? Where are you thinking that um, some attractive investment opportunities would arise for you guys? I think you have to be creative. There's, there's funny things you might not think of. Um, we're actually working with a company right now. This is, let me build the other way, but a company that makes um, dance clothing, primarily dance clothing for, say, young women and girls. And all the dance classes have stopped. So yeah, but they're still dancing. Trust me, I have a six-year-old at home and I, there is no yeah. stopping her. <laughs> you bought her new clothes recently? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Good customer. They, they've, they've noticed a huge <laughs> drop in sales. 
Great, thank you very much. Wojciech, from your perspective, can you talk to us about where you see some of the focus coming uh, on the sector front? Sure, let's start with hotels again. I mean, our perspective is that there are, there, you've got two separate segments. So you have, uh, again, our focus maybe on Poland, Polish opportunities a little bit. Uh, you have the, the resort hotels and the whole move of staycation where, where the both poles went, didn't travel and just went to mountains or seaside or lake lake district and then you had some germans coming over uh, because it was safe and near that yeah. resulted in the resort hotels doing very very well some of them are talking to us saying we've done better this year than last year during summer so so actually the it was an incredible few months for them they look with a lot of worry into the next three six months because the, now they are hoping for the conference sector to come in for the, for the uh, corporate sector to come in with their events. Now, will that happen? Maybe some, but maybe not so much. And therefore, um, that's an opportunity where, where probably you can, you can see they will be interested in investors. But on the other hand, are they going to be realistic about the pricing? Are they going to be, to be wanting to, to discount? We don't know because, because in a sense, uh, they had a good summer. Um, and then you have the, 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 the town hotels, which are, it's a bloodbath. Nobody is there. Yeah. There are a few percent. The capacity utilization is sometimes 5, 10, 20 percent at most. And they are really worried whether they will survive the next few, few months. And if they are more realistic on pricing, then I suppose a uh, long term view is that if you are not fully focused just on conference sector, then, then you can you can be a well, uh, uh, quite profitable business still. We will come in, we'll help, we will, we will, we'll invest. And uh, moving to, to, for example, to in property sector to offices, there is a huge challenge. I mean, uh, you tell us, you know, whether whether people are still going to be going to hotel to 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 offices and how, what is the capacity utilization going to be? Are we going to be having uh, different offices that we are after? Are the towers are still going to be exciting if we have to get into the lifts and so on and so, so forth? But that's an opportunity because because clearly here there is there is a sector which is which is uh, not as uh, strong today as it was half a year ago. Yet there is a mountain of money that wants to invest in the sector. So actually, the discounts we are seeing here are. 5, 10, 15 percent at most for time being, and um, and I think that's that's an opportunity. But but also there is some intrinsic worry about about the sector. And then you have you know quite a few uh, temporary situations that my colleagues have been mentioning. You know there there's clearly there's clearly the health sector where intrinsically it's a good sector. Uh, and yes, they've been suffering. They've been suffering uh, for the last few months. So. Uh, in some parts, so we'd love to invest there. The question is, are they in a situation that that um, that offers a bit of a discount, or 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 that that they are becoming more realistic? And again, I think the banks and uh, quite a lot of of uh, of other players are saying uh, are helping them. So so it's still a little bit unclear. Um, so maybe that's 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 some uh, some of the sectors maybe. Great, thank you very much, Matthew. I know that you wanted to add something on this front. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the thing on the thing on sectors, uh, you know, it, it's still ultimately you come back to basics, which is, yeah. you know, if, if you if you're looking at a business, what what's its market, what's its customer base, and is that still going to be there, um, and is that going to be growing as and when this is over, or in some cases, obviously, it could be growing right now. That's then not unlikely to be a distress deal if people there are a lot of sectors doing very well out of this. Um, but I think, um, you know, particularly in terms of CE, like mentioned logistics, I mean, I think that is clearly something that's, that's going to grow and, and it's not as developed in CE as it is in, in Western Europe. So there are definitely opportunities there. You know, Wojciech has mentioned specifically, you know, the, the value concerns, which I think the, the problem you've got is you've got a lot of industries where, um, yes, they've been hit horribly by the last six months. So you, but you'd look at them and go, but they do have a market and a customer base that's still going to be there and that's going to be growing. But the question is, do current ownership or, or creditor base have appetite to accept that the last six months means that the investment point now is, is at a discount to where it would have been 
six, six, seven months ago. Uh, and I think that's doing distressed M&A deals that are not at the just the single dollar level, uh, the nominal value level is going to be very, very hard for mm. another six, nine months, whatever sector you're looking at, because um, if it's a sector that you you feel has value in it in the longer term and that you want to invest in, then obviously existing ownership and creditor base is also <laughs> aware of that. Yeah. Um, and if it's not a desperate scenario, what, they're not going to want to offer a heavy discount just because of, of six months of a, of a completely unforeseeable external factor affecting their trade. Um, briefly on offices, I think, I, th I think the death of the office has, has been massively overestimated. I, 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 I don't think, uh, I think people are increasingly realising the longer this goes on, uh, how much interaction, yeah. physical human interaction is, does matter and is important. Yes, it doesn't have to be every day anymore and the same hours it used to be and everything else, but it's still needed. It's quite nice um, to leave the home compound every once in a while, no? <laughs> <laughs> is that too, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, I think that will come back. Um, but I think business travel uh, is something that will, I, can, I, can, I can't see that getting back to the levels it, it was at for a long, long time. And, and even the airlines themselves are, uh, you know, are saying that's three, four years away um, in, in most of their forecasts. So, um, so, so I think that's the sector that that's really going to struggle, whether it's the hotels, the airlines themselves or, or, or what have you. But as you say, I mean, the tourist hotels, absolutely. Um, so I think there's, uh, you know, there are there are definitely opportunities. But you, if you if you're looking, you fundamentally start with does this have a market and a customer base that's still going to be there and, and and has some growth potential out the other side. And that um, hasn't actually and that hasn't actually changed throughout the crisis. Those criteria are they were that way beforehand, and they should still be the same after the crisis. I, I think one of the challenges again though is that what has happened through this crisis as has happened a lot over the last decade, is fundamentally an awful lot of companies have taken on an awful lot more debt. Mm. Um, and, and that needs to be dealt with somehow. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think that is going to be a real problem if, if, you know, when we're looking at the balance of finance and operations, and you're obviously trying to, to, to get a business to a level where it's financially viable, and it can make its debt repayments and everything else through the changes that you make in the operations. Um, but the more debt that's on there, the harder to stroke potentially impossible that actually becomes. Um, and, and I think as you know, if you look to invest as well, then obviously that debt, you need to restructure that debt needs to be dealt with in some way. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how different governments are open to uh, their either indirect or direct share of that debt and how that might be, because um, that's where an awful lot of that extra liquidity has come from, yeah. how that might be restructured looking forward. Okay, thank you very much. Matthew, you also wanted to um, give some views from your side when it comes to government intervention and the, the help that some of the businesses have had specifically in the CEE region. Do you want to share those with us? I think it was, it's just worth, you know, you asked a question earlier in terms of, of perhaps the difference seen uh, on government intervention between perhaps CE and, and Western Europe. I, I think one of the key things we've seen uh, at different levels of, of and sizes of business is that in CEE, it has been the case in a number of situations where governments have made promises. And I can think of examples we've looked at and worked on in, in Romania, in Greece, for example, uh, a couple of other Balkan countries where, you know, early on, governments uh, made a promise of a certain level of support to a company. Uh, that enabled that company to continue trading and the creditors to allow, allow that to happen. And the money never actually came through. Uh, and one or two of those businesses have therefore gone into insolvency processes as a mm. result. Uh, and I would say that is one of the key differences. So um, from what we've seen, I mean, in certain CE countries, we've seen liquidity promises from government that haven't been followed through, whereas in Western Europe, they have invariably followed through. Uh, and, and that includes some relatively large large businesses as well, um, and large checks that should have been written and haven't been. So. And haven't been. OK, something to keep an eye on in the future. Now, I wanted to move on next to talk about some of the turnaround strategies that you guys are implementing with your portfolio of companies. However, there has been a question already coming through um, from one of our audience members who's saying, talking about all these different real estate classes, what are your views on shopping malls and retail parks? Personally, probably depressing, but... <laughs> Jonathan, where do you stand when it comes to those two areas of real estate assets? 
Those are already interesting assets before we went into COVID, but we already had, you know, in Poland, we're already looking at the, uh, the first generation shopping centers that were already obsolete and having yeah. difficulty finding, finding re repurpose. Um, so that's obviously not going to get any easier. Yeah. And I guess the good thing about Europe or the, is it's not as overbuilt as, as the U.S. and not the gigantic retail footprint the U.S. has to deal with. What check from your perspective? Yeah, I, I think there is a distinction. First of all, Central and Eastern Europe has a different use for shopping malls than Western Europe. I mean, if yeah. we're talking about Poland again, we really don't have the high street in the same sense as, as London, for example, and so on. So shopping malls have more intrinsic value and more of a stronger position uh, for, for longer term. They are not dead yet. Um, they might have to adjust a bit, but but I think we believe stronger uh, in their survival with maybe a, a slightly more discounted value, but they need to, to adjust a bit, but I think they, they have a place for, for time to come. And then in retail, you have also retail parks, and actually, I've been just talking to a colleague who's, uh, uh, who owns quite a, a large position there. And retail parks are doing extremely well. They've, they've come back to, to, to the numbers that they were uh, at uh, um, half a year ago, nine months ago. So, so there, are, there are also segments there that, that, that they are doing very well. Again, let's remember that Central and Eastern Europe is not as e-commerce oriented yet. As, as Western Europe. So, so I think from a retail point of view, uh, those, those assets, are, um, they need adjustment. They are clearly discounted, sometimes 40, 50% to, to what it was. Uh, that's actually a probably very attractive opportunity, uh, but you have to have nerves of steel to, to invest there. <laughs> nerves of steel in a long time frame. No, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, again, and that's a view on, uh, like with offices, it's, it's a view on, on, on also what's going to happen with pandemic, uh, what, uh, what we heard, what Lech was saying, you know, is it 2022, but actually is there the end, if we believe that there, the pandemic is over one way or another in six months, nine months, 12 months, then then, 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 in a sense, you know, those 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 places are coming back, and you've you've had a huge investment, uh, not even in five years' time, but your return will be in two two and a half years' time on 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 shopping malls. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I'd like to move on to sort of our last uh, area of discussion, talking about some of the strategies that you're pursuing, and maybe also some of the deal structures that are being put in place. Uh, Lek, I know that that is an area of your expertise. Um, can you talk to us on what sort of advice you're providing to your clients at the moment when it comes to structuring certain transactions? Uh, well, um, I could uh, prepare a PhD, another PhD on this topic, but I try to be very, very brief. I'm, I'm talking about the length, you know, of, of uh, because there are, there are, you know, various issues, repercussions, etc. But trying to be like audience friendly, I think that um, whenever we deal with distressed investors from uh, Western Europe, they are used to certain um, uh, procedures where they can buy free and clear of any encumbrances. And that's the very first questions they ask. They ask, you know, how how do I do it? That I do it efficiently and I'm protected and real real quick. And then here yeah, the answer is that we do have some such procedures under po Polish law. Yeah. Uh, the, the one is uh, the the acquisition of distressed assets uh, in uh, enforcement proceedings. Another is uh, uh, the prepackaged pre liquidation in the bankruptcy proceedings. I mean, for the first time for the enforcement, uh, you could only use those to buy uh, single specific assets in um, uh, in bankruptcy, prepack bankruptcy, you could buy a going going concern. Uh, I mean, this legislation has been has been in place for uh, more than four years now. Uh, however, it was uh, substantially uh, amended uh, back in March uh, this year making the process more transparent, less of a private sale, which I, I think should be a plus because that should reduce the, the, the conflicts between the various stakeholders. You could also buy in, um, uh, in the so-called deep reform uh, proceedings, it's postemporanie sanacyjne in Polish, uh, in um, uh, free and clear of encumbrances, 
but this is this is again uh, i mean this 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 in fact relates only to some non core assets uh, yeah. of, of the business now having said that those procedures are not very well tested so because we don't have an, an, an a market for distressed assets in 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 poland and when we we are asked a, a question you know how long it takes uh, there, there, there isn't, I mean, we wouldn't issue a, a, a clean opinion on this. So, so in other words, I mean, our advice would be, would, uh, would be fraught with various re reservations as to the process. So interestingly enough, the largest uh, distressed MNA, which happened in, 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 in Poland last year, was the acquisition of uh, uh, wind farm energy assets of the Inventus group by a uh, tower of Polska Energia, uh, one of the largest energy players in the in the Polish market, and they were they were planning for for a prepack liquidation for some time, but they didn't. They weren't completely. Um, uh, they didn't feel com uh, very confident with the length, with the structure, etc. And eventually, they they did something which could be could be a uh, kind of a track for for the Polish market. For certain, for certain deals, not for every, each and every deal, but they did rely on, 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 uh, on the insurance of uh, reps and warranties of, uh, of, uh, of the managing uh, team. I am saying managing team because the, the companies in question were partnerships rather, rather than equity companies. And uh, it took them a, a while to negotiate, but I, I mean, overall, I can see, I can see interest from also from insurers to invest uh, this distressed M&As. And uh, until we really have some uh, fraud situation, criminal proceedings, I, I, I think many, many uh, M distressed M&A deals could be run, run with the use uh, of those uh, insurance uh, schemes, which would be uh, which would resemble to a greater degree um, the classical M and A transactions, yeah. and from that perspective, that could even uh, give uh, you know way for more players, not not uh, not not only the distress investors investors doing uh, only distress investing, but maybe for some traditional private equity players who would feel comfortable with with the structures. I, I mentioned at the beginning those simplified restructuring proceedings, and that's yeah. that's that's an interesting phenomenon because debtors can can uh, restructure uh, uh, being uh, out of court, being also protected from creditors uh, for the duration of of the proceedings, which is up to four months. And I, I would say that an interesting structure would be discussions with with the company, and maybe even buying the shares in the company, but subject uh, to the approval of the arrangement, final and non-appealable, obviously, approval of the arrangement uh, by the restructuring court, because that proceeding is, is basically uh, consists in the debtor proposing certain arrangement proposals and then uh, uh, gathering uh, votes um, uh, by way of gathering voting cards. I mean, creditors meeting could also be, be, be held. Yeah. And once the, the arrangement is voted through by the creditor, the, 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 the debtor uh, goes to the court for, for the approval of the arrangement. Uh, once the arrangement is final and, appeal and non-appealable, I mean, there could be certain challenges, obviously, it's a court process. But once it is, uh, then the company is, is, is restructured in a sense that if, the, if the, invest, the investor feels comfortable with the restructuring plan, with the viability of the restructuring plan, it could even uh, invest uh, through, through the stock of the of the company, and uh, in, uh, I think that could be some kind of a middle structure, uh, also available to to players who don't necessarily want to deal with uh, bankruptcies or enforcements. But in some cases, indeed, uh, those those uh, you know free and clear uh, structures would be necessary to give. A proper protection to the investors. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Matthew, Jonathan, and Wojciech. Wojciech, you're you're nodding along. Are those structures that you are using in your deal so far already? Uh, we've been looking at at those structures indeed, and uh, there is, uh, you know, there is as as Lex said that, that there is a choice of, of a few. Um, those are complex procedures. You, yeah. And and again, looking at those 
and one problem we have when we are looking at, at those situations from 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 the west is is really just readiness to enter such complex situations so basically so far our experience is looking at exciting situations which you could do through pre-pack which you could do through some of those arrangements and yeah. then saying you know what they are slightly too complex uh, to do out of london yeah. um and really unless you have the presence uh, on the ground it's it's just one step too far i think so far so far jonathan you're a bit closer to the ground there um operating out of vienna uh, are those structures that you're using in your transactions already no, at the moment, really focusing more on the structures and focusing more on fixing the company's yep. sort of repositioning. And I guess the way to put it is in every crisis, there's opportunities. So we see a lot of opportunity to drive business transformation. Okay. So coming out of a situation where the, you know, a lot of cases we deal with private equity sponsors and they had um, a huge amount of cash and they were covenant light borrowing. And as long as the company was showing sales growth, and not asking for cash, it was mostly a hands off, no questions, you just keep running your business. And now that's changed. Mm. And now I think the sponsors have realized it's time to actually ask a little more questions. How is this business being run? Is this business scalable? What happens when the sales drop? As we've seen sometimes that can create, re reveals a lot of the underlying flaws in the business, the so lack of systems and procedures in place, yeah. lack of um, management ability to deal with adversity. And so we are trying to help sponsors and help ourselves in some cases get companies in a better position for sale not maybe today but maybe down the road in a year or so so we're looking at a little bit of longer term rather than going for the quick quick wins right now and from a matty before i come to you just jonathan can you elaborate a little bit what does that practically look like um you talk about processes you talk about management capability talk us through what that looks like on a day-to-day -day business a uh, day-to-day um operational side of the business uh, an example, a company that we're, this is in the healthcare sector. A company we were working with has, um, well, up into COVID, they were doing fantastically, and they had tre tremendous EBITDA. But it was all sales driven, so the whole company was driven by the sales team. Yeah. Very little focus on back office. So as long as they were selling, no one asked any questions. If someone had a lot of different people running around doing crazy little um, tasks that could be automated. So yeah. going through had a lot of shadow finance functions. You've got three or four people duplicating the same function just in different parts of the company, and no one's paying attention to that. So it's a lot of sort of going through the organizational structure with management, figuring out are these people necessary, or are these people doing? Can you reposition these people? Yeah. And how do you make this actually a lean company, a lean machine that can then fight into the future? Okay. Great, thank you very much. Matthew, some final comments from your side when it comes to um, how you're addressing some of the challenges that the businesses that you're invested in are dealing with at the moment. Um, oh, I think, I mean, in terms of that, it's, it's key to obviously take a holistic view and, and uh, you know, you've got to look at across, we tend to break things down into you've got the financial side, you've got the operational side and, and you've got the management. Uh, and, and you've got to you've got to look at all areas under each of those headings and, and see where uh, where you can make tweaks and improvements. And, and one of the other key things is that obviously if you're if you're looking at a situation for the first time and you spot some easy wins, get them implemented there and then. Yeah, one, one of the biggest problems we see in a lot of situations is, is you, you get a lot of people who are quite good at identifying where issues are and some people who are quite good at identifying what the solutions might be not many people who are very good at actually implementing those solutions and, and making it work whether that's uh, you know post acquisition integration you're looking at or a distress turnaround or, or what have you so uh, yeah it does come as, as I said at the start you know having actually hands on boots on the ground and, and hands on uh, actually supporting that is, is key mm. um, just one brief thing on, on structures as, as well I think you know there's, there's some key key um, uh, um, areas to distinguish so I think um, you know you've obviously uh, companies that have already gone into an insolvency process and deals that can be done on the assets and relatively clean because the debt's gone is one thing trying to do deals that uh, involve a solvent restructuring is, is obviously something very, very different. And mm -hmm. are we seeing, or do we expect to see much on that side uh, on the on the equity front in terms of deals in the equity? No. Mm -hmm. um, are we seeing, do we expect to see a lot being done in, on the debt in those companies? Absolutely. And that's where I expect most of the, the transactions to be. Uh, when you do look at equity, one of the big shifts that, that we've seen is it's very, very difficult at the moment um, to, to look at corporate trade buyers completing on equity deals because of that valuation issue I was mentioning earlier. 
Yeah. Whereas I think PE have a bit more flexibility in terms of deal structures and, and structuring uh, ultimate um, deal value being paid out over a period of time than say a, a listed company suitor would do. And we've seen that with uh, a company we've been working on actually going into the crisis uh, was being pursued by two trade buyers uh, and was looking at, you know, potentially really quite an attractive exit for the, for the current owners. Um, those, one of those trade buyers has completely gone away because their own business has tanked as a result of, of COVID. The other one is still very much interested, but is clearly looking for a much a big discount on the value it was looking at seven months ago. Um, so, and, and obviously the vendors are not interested in that. No. But actually, uh, we've now got two PE suitors who can be a bit more creative with their deal structure, whereby the you know they're not going to pay uh, what the trade buyer might have paid seven months ago up front for this company, um, but they can structure some deferred consideration linked to a return to levels of performance that were seen previously that would ultimately see the vendors realise close to what they were hoping to get originally and certainly much more than a, a listed company trade buyer can pay right now and um, okay. because they can't look at those sort it's too complicated for them to look at those sort of structures and yeah. get those signed off by board etc so um i think those are the the, the you know what we're looking at going forward and, and so for pe i think there are opportunities actually to step in where you would have always assumed seven months ago the trade buyer is going to pay more um, but PE can be a bit more creative with their deal structures to take advantage of that. Okay, that's definitely something that's coming out of the event in general, the role that PE is going to be playing going forward, stepping into situations where maybe, yeah, as you said, a trade player would have, would have um, invested in at an earlier stage. Guys, thank you so much for sharing all your insights. I've had a really great time listening to you and just hearing about your experiences over the last seven months, but obviously also where things are going in the future. Um, there are no other questions from the audience, so we're going to wrap this up there. I'd like to say once again, thank you so much to all of you sharing your opinions and your insights. Thank you very much to the audience for taking the time to listen to us. And hopefully we will see you again in person next year in Warsaw. I'd like to say thank you very much again. Uh, and over to Gianna, uh, Juliana in the, uh, in the studio. Bye. Thanks to Catherine and the panellists.